Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, today, we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Charlottetown Mayor Philip Brown. Charlottetown might be a small city, but it's bursting with big city energy and infectious island vibes. It's got all the charm and hospitality PEI is famous for, plus culinary experiences and an arts and culture scene that takes visitors by surprise in the best way possible. Now you can soak in the romance and nostalgia of Charlottetown's postcard perfect streetscapes, wander along a boardwalk where lobsters, boats, and sailboats cozy up, Stay in the B&B that will give you serious and of Green Gable energy. Sounds good? Now it's time to discover Charlottetown. So stay tuned. We'll be right back after a quick message with the cross-border interviews featuring Mayor Philip Brown. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Mayor Brown, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Um, I want to start by getting to know the man behind the persona a little bit, if you don't mind. And I've got to ask the question I've asked every single municipal leader across Canada who's ever come on the show. So you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Pete? Philip? So, um, Chris, uh, my family is fifth generation residents, Charlottonians. Uh, my great grandfather moved here from Ontario back in the late 1800s. He got involved, he got into the uh, horse business, that was his passion, and then he opened a hotel, the Rivera Hotel. Um, and his first part of his life living here in Charlottetown, he got established in his business, and then he ran in politics, and he ran for mayor in 1916, and he was elected. So he was a mayor. Uh, he was the mayor of Charlottetown from 1916 to 1918, a three-year term. And during that time, his last year was the uh, breakout of the Spanish influenza in October of 1918. Um, within several weeks, there were uh, several hundred uh, uh, victims or several hundred cases. Um, by February of 2019, um, there were about 90 plus deaths and several thousand uh, cases. So the reason I put that in that context, because when I was elected in 2018, 100 years later, within two years, we were hit with a world pandemic, COVID-19. So it was like history repeating itself. My grandfather uh, didn't take over the hotel. His brother did, Byron Brown. Uh, my grandfather get into the oyster business, which that, that uh, back at that time, it was during prohibition. So prohibition was, we were one of the last provinces to end prohibition. And he had an oyster bar, which meant he served oysters and spirits. Uh, Legally or illegally, but it 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 that's how it it uh, it uh, transpired. And uh, my dad went to war, uh, him and his brother. And when they come back in 1947, because they stayed on after the war during the reconstruct reconstruct reconstruction of Europe, uh, they came home because their father had passed. So they get into the oyster business. But it was 1948, Prohibition ended. So dad, my dad started his own business, uh, transport and, and boom truck. Or in Ontario, they refer to them as 
cherry pickers. Uh, Dad was always involved in politics, I think, coming from his great grandfather. Um, then he did run as a candidate for the Liberal Party in 1966, wasn't elected. Uh, but ever since 1966, our family of nine kids and the mom and dad, we worked for the great red machine, the Liberal Party. And uh, I get involved with uh, student politics uh, in my fourth year at UPEI, University of Prince Edward Island. I ran for student union president, was elected, um, and then uh, spent my one year. And after that, I went out west, did a couple of years and work in, in uh, Alberta, then Saskatchewan, and back, uh, studied French at the uh, University of Laval and the University of Quebec at Chicoutimi. Spent some time over in Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, as a volunteer, working with Canadian Crossroads International. But during that time, my brother, Richard, uh, was elected to city council in 1983. And he served on city council for 14 years. And in 1997, he ran as a uh, member of the Liberal Party and was successful. But in 2000, he was uh, defeated. So... There was an opportunity for me to run. But just to get back to my history of getting my my schooling, I did the, uh, I did go back to UPEI, took my BED, my Bachelor of Education. And within two years, I get into teaching full time and taught for 30 years. Uh, but my second uh, tenure of uh, teaching was at my old elementary school, Prince Street School, where I taught for 20 years. So in 2000, I ran for council and I ran for city council for uh, Ward 3 and I was uh, successful and was elected. And I guaranteed, I guaranteed or promised myself and my wife and and then at that point, my daughter that I would, and a son, we had a, a newborn son that I'd run two terms because I believe in term limits. So I was elected in 2000, re-elected in 2003 and then stepped away in 2006. So after about being a year out, I said, you know, I'm, I'm getting itchy feet again. I think I might, you know, see what's going on, feel, test, test the waters. So in 2010, I ran for mayor and um, wasn't successful in my first uh, attempt, but it was a learning experience because instead of just covered a, a electoral district, a ward, we have 10 wards. I had to cover the whole city, learned a little bit how to do that, how to manage my time, where to be, where not to be. So in 2014, I said, well, you know what, let's try it again. So I put my name on the ballot. Um, again, I did not get across the finish line. First, uh, my op opponent, Clifford Lee, who was incumbent, uh, won that, his, that was his fourth election. So Longest serving mayor of Charlottetown, if I'm not mistaken, correct? He was four, four, four <laughs> terms. He was the longest serving. And, you know, great guy. I served two terms with him as uh, one term as counselor and one term while he was mayor. So in 218, he said, time to leave. So I offered again. And this time there were five candidates for mayor. One included my sister-in-law. So my sister-in-law, Kim, who also sat in council, from 2003 to 2010, she said, I'm going to run for it too. So I said, okay, this is going to be interesting. I was wondering who my wife would vote for, but I think I did get her vote. <laughs> so I did win. And uh, first term, 218 to 20, 2022, as I said earlier in the interview, uh, in 2020, we were hit with the pandemic. It changed how we did, uh, you know, we were doing uh, uh, governing governing at, at, at all levels, but it brought this great tool that we're using today, Zoom, Google Meet, um, Skype. It, look, it, it's transformed how we do business now, not only in government, but in, in the private sector. Just today, Chris, to give you an example, we had a Zoom meeting with, uh, with uh, some members, three members from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And one council that's been here for 24 years after the meeting, he said, because we used the big screen and, 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 and the mics, he said, well, I didn't know it was that easy. I said, this is the way to do it. It's a great way to communicate. You don't have to get, get into a, 
get into airports, Pearson Airport, walking around for hours waiting for flights. And again, it showed us how to use this tool more effectively and uh, more efficiently in communicating with each other. And then another positive from COVID-19 was it really put a standardization on personal hygiene, high communal hygiene, because Chris, living in Cote d'Ivoire for six months, hygiene in different parts of the world have different applications. And it, you know, you could see this anywhere you go, especially when you live in a diverse, inclusive, and an equitable community that Charlottetown has become because the, the the whole COVID brought people down here coming from Ontario, from out west, to say, hey, I can work from anywhere. I can work from uh, a a yacht in, in the Caribbean and still get paid. So it really changed how we looked at ourselves. But that whole hygiene uh, factor was, it was just took a, a 180. And, and, and I think for the better, uh, for the whole and for the greater community. So here I am in my second term. I am a, uh, I was a reelected in 2022. Uh, there were three candidates. Um, I knew it was going to be a lower turnout because every time there's a second term, the, the enthusiasm wasn't there like it was in 218 because there were five candidates and uh, a brother-in-law and a sister-in-law running against each other, which made the 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 the, 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 the entire family comes out. <laughs> the whole family. And 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 we still had to have at, at the, the election was in on November 6th or 7th, 2018. So for the Thanksgiving dinner. Of course, I had to have my sister-in-law over because my sister said we have to invite the whole family. So at that meal, we we actually shared pumpkins. She took my pumpkin and I took her pumpkin. We got a photo op. So it it, it was a really it, a, a good election. We we stayed positive. 2022, I stayed positive, but we worked really hard to get the vote out because, because I knew and the election team knew that was going to be a low turnout. So it was very, very important to get our base out. And we did. And I won, I was, I was successful in all 10 electoral districts uh, and uh, won with a good majority of, of the vote. But again, I believe in term limits. I see my second term as not as a lame duck. Uh, I see my term as looking at projects that were started in 218, 2022. Now I'm looking at finishing the, those projects from 2022 to 2026. So it's been a great experience. Um, as people say, are you done? Well. Uh, on May 6th, I turned 65. I've retired from teaching. We still have the family business my, that my father's and my mother started back in 1948. So I do have options. But public service has always been uh, deeply ingrained in our uh, in our DNA as, as a family. And same with my mother's family. They were involved. Didn't go to the to the level of getting elected or running, putting their name on a ballot. But I've always appreciated that Anyone that puts his or her name on a ballot, um, kudos to them because it's easier to sit there on, 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 on a, on a, in a glass tower and throw rocks or you know carry that dark cloud around with you. Put your name in the ballot if you want to make a change. What was it for you about the municipal realm that kept you coming back? Because you, you run in 2001, you reelected in 2003, you run again in 2010, 2014, elected in 2018 and 2022. And you could have chosen many different paths. From your introduction there, You, it sounds like you could have chosen the federal path, you could have chosen the uh, provincial path, but at the end of the day, you chose municipal. And I think this is what the show is about, is about why yeah. people get involved in the municipal realm, because I truly believe it's the most important, but it's the yeah. one that most people are tuning out of and saying, yeah. it's as long as my gas is turned on, my, my water is turned on in the morning and my garbage is picked up, I don't care what's happening at City Hall. Yeah. For you, though, it sounds like that's different. While your backstory is there, you could have chosen that provincial route. What was it for yeah. you municipally that said, Okay, Philip's best chance to serve his community is at the council table. So this is where the rubber hits the road at this level, because uh, I was over to Halifax just a few weeks ago, and Mike Savage, who, as you know, is the mayor of Halifax, this is his third term he's leaving. He was also a federal MP, and he was at a smart, smart talk conference about using technology 
fiber network, Wi-Fi, all those commun systems, communication systems to make cities, uh, municipalities stronger, more effective, more efficient. And he said, you know, I'm leaving. Uh, I will not be reoffering. But at this level, this is where it all happens. He said, in a party, in a party system, you have to go with the party, and 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 the party doesn't. You may not always agree with the party, but party loyalty matters. At at the at the municipal level, we're like Halifax. Uh, we don't have a party system. So when I sit around this table in this chamber, uh, Chris, this is I'm in the chamber right now. There are ten parties. There are ten councillors representing ten distinct, um, very interactive, very concerned uh, dis, uh, elect, elect, electoral districts or wards that care about their community. And I see myself as a leader amongst leaders. That's what I am. I, I'm, I don't see myself as the, 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 the king on the top of the hill. I just see myself as trying to work collaboratively, cooperative. And that's always been my approach. And I think this is the best level to, to work at. Will, will I rule out provincial politics? I, I never ru rule out any option to work or help out my community because your community is, is is what it is because of the people that put something into it or take something from it. And I always look, it's a give and take. And when I see my, when I saw myself as a counselor, I saw myself trying to work with other counselors, but I knew to get reelected, uh, Chris, I had to serve the interest and, and call upon the, 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 the constituents who, who, who elected me the first time and then reelected me the second time. So it's 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 politics in the true sense is that you, you have to work together to make things happen. It, it, you don't need a party whip coming and saying, we need this vote and uh, we know you're against it, but you have to show up for the vote because we don't know if we have enough votes on the floor in the Legislative Assembly or in the Parliament, Parliament of Canada. And that's that's why I chose this. Uh, to, uh, that's why I made the choice of, of taking this route. And very proud of it, and I'm very humble to represent the residents of Charlottetown. I don't take it for granted. Um, I always say in politics, one day you're on top of the hill, you're the king of everything. Next day, you lose, or you leave. You're just another guy in the street. I, I, I've seen the change of the role that the municipalities are playing in today's society over the last, and I say this as a political observer from the last probably 24, 25 years uh, after leaving journalism school. I have seen the role of the municipality change dramatically. They are dealing with more issues that they weren't dealing with 24 years ago. Yeah. I can imagine the issues that you're dealing with today are not the issues you were dealing with when you were first elected in 2001, no. whether that no. be provincial issues or even federal issues. You know that the municipality has a role to play. You know the city has a role to play in the day-to-day -day lives of the people, but the average resident doesn't care about those those lines, those jurisdictional lines have you seen a blurring of those lines and have you noticed that the municipalities are picking up more issues that they weren't traditionally even or are not even not even traditionally are still not responsible for but they need yeah. to address them because they're affecting their citizens and the people of Charlottetown yeah yeah well you know, well chris take housing for example housing back in 2010 was an issue housing back in 2014 when i ran was an issue I kept calling it out that we need more public housing, social housing, subsidized housing, uh, co-op housing. We we need more affordable housing, and it wasn't it wasn't ringing any bells. Two eight in two thousand eighteen, it was the top priority, and get and and another part of that whole housing issue was the short term rentals, the Airbnbs. You know we have to get rid of them. We have to you know control them, regulate them. And I always said at public forums or at debates, they only make up a little slither. Of the of, of the problem of housing, the big problem of housing is what the federal government and provincial government got away back in the eighties, the nineties, more in the in two thousand away from building, financing, operating, maintaining public, social, affordable, subsidized, and co op housing. So now it drops down to the the, the level of of municipalities, and you know. Federal government under under the uh, under the Rapid Housing Initiative, we picked up five million dollars from the feds to build affordable housing using the Rapid Housing Initiative. We're now in the game. 
right? So then people are saying, well, you're, you're contributing money. I said, no, all we did was we took federal money, transferred it from that account to the provincial uh, coffers because they were, this project that we're looking at for 84 units in the north end of the city will be totally affordable, geared to seniors and, and, and single parents, male or female with children at rents that are, in rents that are um, that are based on income, not based on CMHC, which is eighty percent of the median of an amalgamated agglomerated agglomerated area. So we get hauled into that way. Then half come out housing and the, the housing accelerator fund. Let's tap into it. So we tap into that. We receive ten point one million dollars, but it's all about uh, drawing out three years of about eight initiatives to build more density, to increase that net residential density so that we can provide more housing. And I'm a believer of going up instead of going out. We're known as the, the one million acre farm here in Prince Edward Island. Since last year, we're down to about 553,000 acres because of development and because of erosion. So we keep building subdivisions, building, building subdivisions that keep going out to the rural, um, um, unincorporated areas, we're going to lose more and more farmland. That's why it's very important to go up. So, but if I can just finish, Chris. Yeah. So the housing issue was always the top priority for me. It is still a priority for me. We've we we we've created an affordable housing advisory committee. We have an affordable housing tax incentive. We have changed our zoning and development bylaws and the official plan, which is a overall governing structure for development in the city to allow for more bonus points, more uh, um, variances, if a developer or an NGO or a level of government builds affordable social public and 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 uh, co-op housing. Okay, so there's uh, like three different questions I want to ask out of that statement yeah. that you just said there. <laughs> but I want to start with this one because I think this is the most important one. Charlottetown is the, a historic community in Canada. It is truly the birthplace of our confederation. It is the birthplace right. of who, who we are as Canada today. You go to Charlottetown. I've been there a few times. And I, you know, you walk down Main Street, you are transported back to an age where you just can't imagine. Now, I agree. Sprawl is happening, but we also need infill as well to go up. And I agree with yeah. that wholeheartedly. How do you do that in a community that is so historic like Charlottetown? Because you, I'm assuming, have gotten to the edge of your community and there's no place to go but up. But the people in your community, yeah. I would assume, and I don't want to paint a broad stroke here, but no, no. I would guess that there are people saying, I want to keep Charlottetown the historic community that it is. Yeah. I want to keep it the uh, sort of postcard picture uh, landscape that we have grown accustomed to. But yeah. PEI is growing. Charlottetown is growing. Where yeah. do you see doing that without ruffling a few feathers in asking people to take faith in the council's vision of what the city is going to look like in 2050, 2040, 2021? Yeah. So so Upland Planning, a planning uh, consulting firm out of Toronto, very smart group of people working with O2 that they do the logistics for Upland Planning. They've already been into the city. They started some, um, uh, um, what they referred to as uh, just small, intimate uh, sessions, like focus sessions at 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 like, the one that took place was Farm Day in the city, and 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 they, they did a pop up with with you know cards, you know, with surveys, just to get an idea of what what people think about development, about density, and so forth. Then in, in last spring, we had three, four, four uh, public consultations conducted and, and, and headed up by Upland Planning out of Toronto. They identified, Chris, three corridors coming into the city, three corridors. One coming from the east, that's St. Peter's Road and along with Abney. One coming from the north, actually two coming from the north. One due north, Malpec Road coming into University Avenue right down to Great George Street, which takes you into historic Charlottetown. And the other would be on the northwest, would be Lower Malpec Road into North River Road. That would take you down to Victoria Park. They said, these are areas where you can develop density with infill projects. And it's called gentle infill. So where you already have three, four-story apartments in these corridors, 
You can go up to six. You can go up to eight. So that, that's where you get your density. Then we have areas that are wide open in the north end, both the northeast and the northwest, and due west and due east, that have lots of land that can build lots of density. Not single family, not duplexes, but you know they can go with six stories, eight stories. And again, the, the contours of Charlottetown, it, it's up and down. So if you, let's, I can give you an example. Like uh, you, you hit, you hit a, 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 not a panic button for me, but a, really a, a, a talking point that I can talk a lot about. No, Just it's be in the last... because so before you answer, because the reason I ask you, I'm happy you talked about housing is because it's an issue that I want to talk about in a few seconds here, which is with housing comes infrastructure. Infrastructure right. is needed and municipalities are on the hook for the aging infrastructure. And I just recently read an article with you doing an interview with CBC with the mayor of Stratford. And you said, and I'm quoting and I'm paraphrasing a little bit here. Yeah. And that's, I'm, I'm going to let you get back to your statement. But you said it, it, it kind of hurts you when you have to dig up roads because you're not sure what you're going to find. What we're going to get. Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, especially so. so so just this project that I'm going to talk about is, is the Casty Group. And Mike Casty is, is, is owner operator T3, which is our transit system, which by the way, Mike, uh, Chris, is a triple P. It's a private public partnership transit that works very well, that kept us going dr during COVID. A lot of um, systems that were in Moncton, Halifax, shut down because of, 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 the, of, of the, the staff they had. And 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 just the, the regulations that were in 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 place for municipal and provincial and federal government staff. So he's got an, a dream to look at constructing an 1,880 unit complex in the north end of the city, and it would be 16 stories, 14 stories, 12 stories. Like, and I, I admire this guy. He's seven, I shouldn't be telling his age, but I'm going to tell it anyways. He's 70 years old. And he is full of energy and he is he is so creative. Anyways, he's running into roadblocks within our planning department. And I brought up uh, brought it up yesterday at one of our standing committee uh, meetings for planning, development, and heritage. And I said, you know, let's bring him in. Oh, we, we can't do that. We can't do that. Why? Well, you know, he's got an application. In. I said, oh, he has an application in. Well, he's going to get one in. I said, well, let's bring it in. No, can't do that be, because, you know, that's, that's you know, you're, you're giving an advantage to a, a developer over another developer. Anyways, I get back to him. I said, Michael, let's just find another way to promote this project. That 1,880 would be mixed use. It would be one, one, uh, one, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, and it would have different levels of, of uh, socioeconomic levels of, of rent. Like, we can make it work, uh, Chris. And in terms of protecting what we call the birthplace of a nation, Charlottetown, where it all took place back in 1864. And the city itself was established in 1765 when the, the British uh, took over the uh, uh, Ile de Saint-Jean, which was uh, under Nouvelle France, New France, and it became St. John Island and then became uh, uh, Prince Edward Island, named after Prince Edward. But it was Samuel Holland that divided the, the whole island up into 67 lots and three townships. And that township of Charlottetown was established in 1765. So we're no different as a historic city compared to, to Montreal, Quebec City, or any of the, any of the cities south of the, uh, in, in the southern, in, in south of the south of the United States or south of the border. So when I look at our 500 lots, that's every, that's, that's a historic part of our city that goes from Houston Street right to our river, the Hillsborough River. And it covers it's referred to the 500 lots because originally it was cut up into 500 lots. We are very, very, very protective of this historic part of the city because of its 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 its, its significance, historical significance 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 in the birth of of Canada and birth or the birth of this nation. But we know that we have to we have to evolve with the times. Like I was in Quebec City in 2019 for the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. In old Quebec, they are modernized some in their old building by putting more glass to them, by making them look to resemble or project 
uh, architecture of uh, 2020. So we have to do that too. We have to sort of roll with the times to, to make our city look like an evolving place to live. So there are lots of things we can do. And I know protecting the, the, the historic significance of Charlottetown is very high on the priority of city council, of the residents of Charlottetown, and anyone who loves to come and visit Charlottetown. That we will protect. But it's those three quarters identified by Upland. And then how we can take that half funding, which is with the government of Canada, and this is how we're getting drawn into it, uh, Chris. Okay, we'll give you the money. You get to get, get to like the money. Oh, I want more, I want more. Okay, so you get more, then you know what? It's your responsibility. So we've been very ca careful how much we, you know, we go after it. But, you know, if it's there, I'll go after it. And so will all council. But it's, 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 in the end, housing is not just a federal, provincial, municipal responsibility. We all have the same voter, whether they vote at the municipal level, provincial level, or the federal level. But where does the funding come from? We, as a municipality, and you know yourself, Chris, we do not have the fiscal firepower that the province and the federal government have. All we have for taxation power is property tax. You look at the feds and you look at the provinces, they have personal income tax, corporate income tax, consumption tax, excise tax, inheritance tax. Oh, by the way, GST. property tax. Well, that's the consumption tax. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's what that. I call it. Yeah, the consumption tax. And for the provinces, equalization payments. <laughs> so they have all these, these, all these funding channels. We just have one. But I know a former CAO said, no, no, we have others. And I said, what would they be? Well, you know, we got parking meters. Oh, okay, that's that's a big, uh, that's a big money uh, money winner. Or you know, we have uh, meters, parking meters, parking tickets. We have a parking couple of parking garages. But but that doesn't make that doesn't cook bread for me or bake bread for me. You need a source of funding that you know you can rely on going forward. So can I ask the political yes. question here? I'm going to yes, ask sir. a very political question right now. And for those who for, I. I know Scott Pierce's ears are ringing right now, the president of FCM as of recording this. And what you just said is is just music to his ears, I'm assuming. But I'm going to ask a very political question right now. Has the King government, has the Trudeau government done enough to help municipalities work through some of these challenges, whether they be infrastructure, whether they be uh, uh, financial challenges that municipalities are facing? Or do you believe that they can go further? Because FCM, which you are a part of, and you you yeah. talked about you yeah. working with, yeah. um, they have been calling for the provinces and the, uh, the federal government to come to the table to address some of these issues. But it's not happening. And I'm not trying to burst anyone bubbles, but it's not happening in the short term. Do you think that the government should be working closer with the larger cities like yourself, like Halifax, like St. John's, to address some of these fiscal challenges that municipalities are facing? Or are municipalities just sort of left on the ledge here and sort of hoping that they can do this by themselves? Yeah. So I'll start off uh, speaking with bureaucrats at the provincial level. I've, I've been talking about more a tax equity uh, between what the province collects in residential uh, residential and commercial tax and what we collect a, as a municipality, they come back and say, no, no, you need more money. I, I said, yeah, what would that be? Just raise your taxes. I said, no, that's not a, that's not a solution. No. So give you an example, Chris. So the province has residential and non-residential, which is commercial tax. Yeah. They have it for all the municipalities. So on the residential, they collect a a dollar fifty per hundred. Now, if you're a resident of Charlottetown, a resident of Prince Edward Island, it drops to fit a dollar because there's that 50% uh, non-resident tax. So that dollar, if you're a fully serviced community, like Charlottetown is, you get uh, points, cents, dimes, nickels and dimes on what services you provide. So the city provides police, fire, public works, parks and recreation, public transit, EMO, and uh, and planning, planning, which is very important for any municipality. But when the province does their calculations on their equalization payments between the province and the municipalities, what they do is they don't count all those areas. They count police, they count planning, 
They count public works for both streets, roads, and one other area. Only four. So of the dollar they collect, they give us 58 cents on every dollar they collect, and they keep 42. On the commercial side, they collect a dollar fifty per hundred, and we the city collect a dollar thirty six, two thirty six on that. On the dollar fifty they collect on every commercial tax, they keep the whole dollar fifty. So what we're saying, give us a better share of that of that uh, of that of the tax collected, and and that gives us more stable funding going into the future. That's where we need to get to because you know yourself, Chris, municipal municipalities are creatures of provincial legislation. We're incorporated bodies. We're no different than E.B. Brown's Transport and, and, and Transport and Crane Service Incorporated. We're an incorporated body. So as an incorporated body, we, 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 were, we, we, are, we are the creatures of provincial legislation. As for the federal government, they're given, look, during COVID, I can say one thing about Trudeau. He gave two bump ups on the, on the, uh, on the gas tax transfer, which is now the uh, can um, Canadian Canadian Community uh, Building Fund (TCBF) two two double payments um, has it kept up with inflation? No, but the conversation that we had this morning with FCM about uh, about the uh, CCBF, I said, you know, I know when this started. It started when Paul Martin was in Hamilton, Ontario. You may remember this back in two thousand and three, made the announcement that they were going to go with the gas tax transfer. I think on Monday, Chrétien fired him. But 2005, they brought in the gas tax transfer when Paul Martin was 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 prime minister, and it was based on five cents per liter. You remember that? Yeah. So I asked the. FCM, I was at that the, meeting. The FCM, okay, so I, I was, was at, at that FCM, conference in 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 Hamilton. I see. I I had, I, I arrived a day late. He made the announcement the day before. I had to. St- I, because there were no rooms left in the ends in Hamilton, I had to stay in Burlington, which was great. But anyways, so I said to the, the three FCM, uh, um, I'm, not, I'm not gonna call them operatives, but employees. And I said, where, what, what's the percentage now? Oh, I think they take it out of general revenue. I said, come on, come on. What I was asking that if it was still five cents per liter with gas and the, and, and, and the climate, uh, the, I, I don't call it the carbon tax, but the climate tax that, that that they keep adding every six months, that should be raised up to seven cents or eight cents per liter, and then we'll get a better share of the of the tax collect, which will help us greatly in building our infrastructure: water, wastewater, stormwater management, parks and recreation, roads, streets, um, active transportation pathways, multi-use paved pathways. That's that you need more stable funding. The prime minister just announced yesterday or the day before he's created this new six billion dollar infrastructure fund to create more density. He's going to give a billion dollars to municipalities. And he's and and the FCM uh, uh, employees said, that, well, everything hasn't been drawn out yet. Philip. I said, yeah, right here. He says he wants to make sure that every uh, every municipality. For one property, you can get four units on it. That's already in half. He wants to cut out the development charges on on any any development charges over three hundred thousand. There's th- that's already checked out. I said the requirements are there. I said we just want to make sure we get our share. But it's always Chris. I'm going to give you a little money now, and next time if I get a little more money, I'll give you a little more. That doesn't make us work too well. We need yeah. more stable funding coming both from the provincial and the federal coffers. That's the only way it's going to work in the long term. Mike Savage made a an, uh, made an announcement there when I was in Halifax a couple of weeks ago. Uh, BBC reported the morning that he came down to, the, to, to our meeting. 19 municipalities in the UK have gone bankrupt, including, including um, uh, Manchester. These are big cities that are going bankrupt and you know what bankruptcy chris is around the corner for all of us as municipal uh councillors and mayors because you know what our borrowing costs they've been pretty good for the last 10 15 years if that bank rate keeps going up guess what debt servicing keeps going up 
Where does debt service take money from? Projects to pave roads, to build uh, active transportation pathways, to build multi-use paved pathways, to enhance our park system, to provide more police officers so we have more boots on the ground, to make sure we have a fire and an EMO in place of, in case of fire or another hurricane Fiona. That's where we need the funding, and that's where we need the uh, the, the 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 financial uh, support from both levels of government. Now, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be I, I need to make sure that people understand this, and I apologize. And I realize we're at the forty minute mark, and hopefully, you have an extra ten minutes for me here. Go ahead. But I, um, I just want to make sure people realize, and I've said this on this time and time again, municipalities cannot run deficits. While what's going on in That's the right. UK is is completely is a different, unique beast in itself. In Canada, municipalities yeah. cannot run deficits, we but what they can do, they can run deficits in the regards of the issues, the infrastructure challenges, the social uh, uh, deficits, the housing deficits. And that is a bigger concern, I believe, and I would say from this conversation yeah. so far, yeah. you have in the long-term viability of the city of Charlottetown, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Well, you were talking about social, uh, social ills in our, our community. You know yourself, Chris. Yeah. Since COVID, mental health, drug addiction, Alcohol, uh, alcohol abuse. People don't think it's there anymore. It's there. Unemployment, the unhoused, people living rough. It's like when I was growing up, I've said this many times. Can you believe it that we have homeless people sleeping in parks in Charlottetown? Never thought that would happen. But it's it's happening because that I, I call it that gulf between the haves and the have nots is so wide and it's getting wider. And we are going to have these problems. Our police chief, our police forces, their their hands are tied when it comes to uh, when it comes to enforcing uh, um, the illicit drug trade. But and people think illicit drugs is just heroin, mescaline, um, um, LSD. No, it's oxycontin. It's 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 Dilaudid. It's it's fentanyl. These are the drugs that are you can buy at the super at, at, at your at your pharmacy with with a prescription from your doctor. People are watching people on the street taking needles right in the open. Police officers have been told by the federal prosecution office, if it's not a major drug crime, don't come to us. That's what they've said. Like, so their hands are tied. And and this is this is what we're running to, into. Not just Charlottetown. Go, go to Halifax. Go to Moncton. Go to Amherst, Nova Scotia. It's the same problem. We're, it's, 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 it's an epic, epidemic everywhere. And we have to get some kind of control of what's going on in our communities. But all levels of government have to be working with, with the same purpose in mind. People need help. And you know yourself, Chris, over the years, mental health has lagged, lagged. My daughter, my daughter, who is a nurse, she was at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, and they had to empty out the, uh, the, the psychiatric ward because they needed warm room, more room, for patients because of COVID-19 uh, social distancing. Some of those patients went to the uh, went to the Prince County Hospital up in Summerside, went to uh, went to our Hillsborough Hospital, uh, which is a mental health facility, but some of them just fell through the crack, fell through the cracks. So like, there's so much going on in our community. People are saying, we have to do something. Yeah, well, we all have to do something. And then if you try to get people to fill those jobs, mental health, nursing, medical, they're not filling them up. Teachers, I'm a teacher of 30 years, taught for 30 years. I can get a substitute job just like that, but my my tour of duty's done. I'm I'm moving on. And teaching today is not the same as it was when I was teaching the 30 years that I spent in the classroom. So a lot of changes, but the world is resilient. We we'll we, you know, we'll get through it, but it's going to be a lot of tough, tough, um, tough decisions to make. And I, I, I'm so appreciative that our community has become so diversified, so inclusive, and so equitable. Take, for example, the University of Prince Edward Island. 5,800 students are at UPEI. 33% of the population are of international background, representing 100 nationalities. That's, that's what diversity is. That's showing that people can be tolerant of each other. It shouldn't matter the color of your skin, uh, your, your 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 religious background, your ethnic background, your language that should not be part of 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 of, of your being a, of any of us being a social being. 
we all are part of the same room. So do we have a lot to do? Yeah, we do. Uh, Give me a glimmer think, of hope, though. Give me a glimmer of hope uh, that Charlottetown there, there, is setting up itself today for the future, because the challenges aren't going to go away tomorrow morning. Like the moment yeah. we wake up tomorrow morning, you're going to still have to deal with. And I'm assuming the same challenges are going to persist in three months time or when you meet in yeah. Calgary for the upcoming FCM conference. Yeah. Give me a glimmer of hope that you're setting yourself up for a right path here because I don't want people to go away thinking that, oh God, what's going on in Charlottetown is going to be no, horrible no. 10 years from now. Here's the, this is not a glimmer of hope. This is actually happening. If you talk to the on house, what do they need? They need a, a fixed roof over the head. So when they put their head down in the pillow at night, they're safe and secure. Our council, this city is committed to building more housing, increasing that residential density. We know we're going to get blowback from people that just lived in a nice, beautiful uh, R1 uh, single family dwelling with a garage, two, two car garage. Yes, they'll still exist, but you're gonna see mixed housing. We need to do that. We need to be part of finding the solution. And that in, that that pushes us to increase, increase our, our net uh, our, our net residential density. We have to do it and we will do it. And it, when it comes to policing, we will continue to add uh, more police officers like we did in this budget. 11 police officers will be on the beat. We'll be out there working with, with the community. Police chief and his staff are using mental health te uh, uh, techniques instead of using the big stick or, or the taser gun. They're using ways of bringing down some of the intensity of these confrontations with persons that are suffering from mental health, drug addiction. And, and drug addiction, like, I've heard many times in this chamber, look, you just have to bottom out. That's all you have to do, and then you're going to get better. No, drug addiction is not that simple. It's, it's, look, it's in my family. It's in many families. It, it requires a lot of understanding. It requires a lot of love. And it requires a lot of people understanding the situation. It's not just tough love. It means people helping each other. And I think we have that kind of community. And I know we do. And I know that, there will be, Chris. The the rock the rock throwers, I start, I call them sometimes the boulder throwers from the glass towers. They have all the answers, but they want to come down on the ground with us to, to help give us those solutions. You want to make you want to make something happen, buddy? Get down from that glass tower and get roll up your sleeves and get get your hands dirty. That's how we're gonna make things work. And I think, you know what? Canada, with you know, with all its warts and all its blemishes, we're still the greatest place in the country to live, the greatest country to live in this world. And I think we'll always be that way because we are people that are, are, are understanding of each other. And we recognize that if you can live in Canada, you can live in anywhere in the world. Amen to that. Um, Mayor Brown, <laughs> I want to thank you. This has been uh, that, that's the best way to end the interview. Usually I end it. Actually, I have to ask the question because I, I'm writing a book about it. But what makes Charlottetown such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? And that is my final question for the interview. Easy, easy. It's small, right? What I what I call Charlottetown, we're a small city with big city problems, but you can go anywhere. Like my son lives in Toronto. He lives up in Dundas West. It's a nice little neighborhood up there by the beautiful park. It's called Trinity Bellwoods. Do you know the park? Beautiful. Anyways, he lived on Young and King when he first arrived there, uh, Chris. It was it didn't feel homey down there. It was concrete <laughs> jungle. Concrete jungle. Now he's living down in Dundas West. It's just when I walk down there, my wife and we're up a couple of times. You're just you feel like you're in Charlotte. Streets are small, houses are close together, people are out on the streets, people are out on on and this again, this is in the summer, not in the winter. And and they're out on the streets and the sidewalks, people in the park. That's what Charlottetown. It's a small place, but you still can find your space because you can drive 15 minutes north of Charlottetown. 15 minutes north of Charlottetown, and you'll be on the most beautiful beaches anywhere in the northeastern seaboard. I'm, I'll guarantee you that. And if you want to drive an hour west, an hour east, it's the same thing. Charlottetown is not just Charlottetown. Charlottetown is Prince Edward Island. 
I would agree with that. Um, Mayor Brown, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and taking time out of a busy schedule to do this. Um, when I come out to PEI later on this summer, because we've we've you rented an in. RV and I'm gonna make sure that we can go grab a you coffee and in. look and we'll yeah. have we'll continue this conversation. Or when you're out here in Calgary for the upcoming FCM conference, let's so, grab a coffee there as well. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations here on the Cross Border Interviews, where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada and our eye-opening exploration of the decisions local governments make in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. But your support is the backbone of our growth, and we'll be honest with that, and the maintenance of this show that you've come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Now, we are off until Monday, April 22nd, and we'll be back then. So until then, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking.